Jesse, what time do you have? I have 6.30. All right, well then let's kick it off, 6.30. Again, people are gonna be coming in and out throughout the presentation, but we wanna get started right on time because we have a lot to cover today and a lot of excellent information. If I haven't said so already, I wanna give a huge shout out to everybody who's joining us this evening. We are so appreciative that you're here to learn about how to harvest and reuse rainwater. Tonight's webinar is brought to you all through a collaboration with Daily Axe, the town of Windsor in California, and our wonderful partners at Blue Barrel Rain Catchment Systems. Before we do get started, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items uh, as to how to interact with this webinar and with our presenter. You will notice, as I see most of you already are engaging in the chat feature, that's fantastic. You're welcome to continue to chat amongst yourselves um, and we may call out certain things throughout the presentation, but when the presentation is starting, I would like to ask that the chat kind of gets uh, kept to a minimum as it can be a little bit distracting, but I do encourage you all to engage in the Q&A section that you can see right next to your chat option. Uh, by submitting questions into the Q&A, we'll be able to acknowledge them and answer them. It's not likely that we're gonna be answering questions during the presentation, but we absolutely have time dedicated at the end of everything to go over your questions. And if for some reason we do run out of time, we definitely plan on sending resources and a follow-up email, as well as trying to address some of those questions that may have not been answered yet. That's probably it for housekeeping. Let me know if you have any questions between now and the time that we get started. All right. So again, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Liz and I'm a senior programs coordinator with Daily Axe. It's been pretty amazing to see how many people have signed up for this webinar. This is our third or fourth webinar as an organization and I just feel so appreciative to be able to partner with Jesse of Blue Barrel and to see how many people have not only signed up for this webinar, but where you all are coming from. Um, that being said, you're coming from all over the United States, which is pretty amazing. And I'm assuming with all that being said that there are a lot of you that are not actually familiar with our small and mighty, mighty nonprofit called Daily Act. So I wanted to take a moment to introduce ourselves and let you know why we're all here today. So like I mentioned, Daily Acts is a small and mighty uh, holistic education nonprofit. We're based in Petaluma, California. And we take a heart-centered approach to inspiring transformative actions that create connected, equitable, and climate resilient communities. We believe in the power of our daily actions to reconnect people to self, community, and place, which helps to heal our society and our planet. Our holistic approach starts in the soil and swells into culture and policy change. Through over 100 talks, tours, and trainings a year, we implement three interwoven strategies for systems change. First, we spread solutions and models that offer the skills, tools, and resources to grow food, medicine, habitat, and community while conserving our resources. Next, we strengthen a community. We strengthen community leadership by connecting leaders who understand our interrelations of social, economic, and environmental justice issues through networks and alliances. And lastly, we are working to build public and political will by mobilizing our community's power for environmental and climate justice issues. As you can tell, our impact is far and wide. And if you leave with anything from all of this content, I really hope it's the firm belief that you can be the change that you wish to see in the world. And I really believe by having you all here today and trying to learn more about this topic that you, you all are, taking, are stepping up to this opportunity and leaning into the opportunity to be the change that you wish to see. And I hope throughout this webinar, you're learning something new and you're bringing it back to your community, sharing your newfound knowledge, with your friends, your family, again, and your community. And so without any further ado, I would like to pass the spotlight over to Jesse Sabo, who is the founder of Blue Barrel Rainwater Catchment Systems and overall an absolutely amazing educator that we are absolutely thrilled to be working with. So thanks, Jesse, for being here. Well, thank you, Liz. Um, what a lovely introduction. And I'm here uh, in Santa Rosa, California, close to Petaluma, and we're about an hour north of San Francisco, for those of you um, who are joining us from farther away. Um, and I've been thrilled to work with Daily Acts over the years. We've done hands-on workshops. We've done speaking events. Um, you see a photo of one there. That's me in the red jacket. Um, 
and this is new. This is a brand new format that we're doing this online. And um, it's a little interesting for me being in this room that I suddenly spend way too much time in, um, but I'm thrilled that I can be here with you and connect with some people who aren't able to join us for local events. So there's benefits to doing that too. So um, bear with me a second. I'm gonna share my screen and get my slide deck up. Um, okay, share screen. Okay, so I think Liz did a pretty good job of introducing me. My name is Jesse Savo. Um, I am the founder of Blue Barrel. Um, we've been in business since 2012, believe it or not. The years have sort of ticked by. Um, I'm a certified rainwater catchment systems designer. If you ever knew there was such a thing, most people don't. Um, but what Blue Barrel does, we work with food producers all over the country actually to recycle food grade used barrels from the waste stream. Um, and we have a code compliant design that we help people install all over the USA through DIY kits. Um, it's all mail order. Um, so that's the brief introduction to Blue Barrel, um, but we're not focused on Blue Barrel today. We're focused on rainwater harvesting in general and how it fits into the much bigger picture um, of what you see on your screen. So it's no coincidence that we find ourselves here together um, one day before Earth Day. And I wanna take a minute to kind of ground us in this time and place. And I don't know about you, but I find it somewhat disorienting these days, the lines of time and place are sort of blurring together with all this time we're spending at home and routines have been disrupted. And I wanna acknowledge how challenging um, that's been. Um, and I also wanna sort of ground us in this opportunity we have to maybe find some silver linings in all of this. So um, uh, not only is it Earth Day, it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And the fact that we find ourselves in a global pandemic, um, it's sort of a meaningful connection here. And I wanna take a minute and just share um, something I found um, in a news article. This is from the Seattle Times. And the title of the article is what coronavirus tells us about climate change on Earth Day's 50th um, anniversary. So they open the article by quoting themselves. This is an article that came out on Earth Day in 1970. So uh, the headline of that article was pollution to overheat earth says expert. That was the headline stripped across the top of page one. The release of increasing quantities of carbon dioxide and thermal pollution into the atmosphere threatens to change global weather and melt the Antarctic ice cap flooding wide areas. So that's why Earth Day was founded. People were starting to understand this in 1970 and actually, you know, long before. Um, what not a lot is new really. I mean, we're still we're still saying that, that that's still the narrative that we're using and that many people work very hard to try to combat and sometimes it feels like there's no traction. So um, I wanna further bring us to the moment and I'm quoting a lot of, I sort of pulled a bunch of quotes from this article and added some of my own language. So um, I'm reading from behind my screen. So if my eye contact is a little bit off, that's why. Um, but here's how I'm gonna open us today. Earth Day marches are canceled, but the global standstill itself is a profound statement of nature's power and human vulnerability, not only now in the pandemic, but as we wake into a new normal and wonder whether we can or should resume business as usual. This wasn't our idea of how it should happen, but we now plainly see it is within our ability as consumers by changing behaviors to have a direct impact on the course of climate change. The pandemic coordinates us globally and offers a glimpse of how the earth might breathe a little easier with a little less of the carbon economy. Coronavirus is an emergency, but our response to this pandemic also creates an opportunity to change the path that was leading to greater destruction. I wanna recognize and honor that some among us have experienced health impacts, even death of loved ones or extreme economic hardships, or maybe some combination of those things. As we restart, and I understand that'll be a process that may take a few years, really, um, uh, I, I keep this thought close at hand. What can we keep from this unprecedented event that has given us all something in common? So as we all kind of come together in our own spaces, I'm gonna play this video as well. And this was a last minute addition to my presentation. My dad sent this today to his grandchildren and he does not know that I'm showing this. So this is a flock of turkeys and this is a picture of nature kind of quickly resuming and taking its place in the center of the road. 
all we had to do was hit pause for a little while and nature kind of comes back to take its place. So I thought that was a cute video and a, and a good message for this moment. So let's see, how do I advance? So I'm going to take us right into the theme of rainwater harvesting, and I think that's probably why you're here. Um, rainwater harvesting as well is one of our efforts to kind of mimic nature, um, and that's what we need to do to bring the, bring the earth back into a um, more healthy way of being. So what this slide is showing us is plants have ways of collecting water and delivering it straight to their root zones. Um, they have you know, you can, I took these pictures one day just on a walk around a neighborhood and there's just so many different ways that plants grab water out of the air and deliver it to their root zones. So we take, you know, rainwater harvesting is not something I invented. It's not something that any human really invented. It's the way water cycles naturally. Um, and what we're gonna learn about today is how we can kind of shape our environments to help restore the natural water cycle on our, on our properties. So what is rainwater good for? Stored rainwater is nature's perfect source for native plants, perennials, pollinator species, edible plants. I get a lot of questions about that. Rainwater, for the most part, is perfectly suitable for edibles. Um, sensitive plants and potted plants. It's really high quality water. The only kind of irrigation that is not really good for is turf grass. Um, the reasons for that is turf grass takes a lot of water. Um, generally, the effort to catch and store water, it's gonna run out pretty quickly if you're trying to irrigate something as thirsty as turf grass. Um, the other reason is that turf grass requires spray irrigation. Rainwater is really best distributed through a drip irrigation system. Um, again, drip is about 80% more efficient than, than spray. So when you spray that water, you've gone to all the effort to store just pretty much evaporates pretty quickly. Um, I want to draw a quick distinction with rainwater and gray water. Um, Daily Axe is putting on another webinar on gray water um, with Laura Allen coming up, and I know Liz will announce that at the end. Um, I know for a lot of people, you've heard of rainwater, you've heard of gray water, you maybe want to do both, you think maybe they can be combined, so I want to just kind of lay some definitions that they're two different systems, and it's awesome to do them both, but they are separate systems. Um, so rainwater is great for potted plants, edibles, I went over some of these things, and drip irrigation, yes. Um, gray water, and the difference is rainwater is collected from your roof. Um, gray water is what's come through your house already. So things that are coming out of um, showers or often um, laundry to landscape is one of the more typical systems that you've maybe heard of. Um, and that is in-ground subsurface irrigation. It's not great for edibles, less sensitive plants. You have less control about sort of the flow of that water, non-drip irrigated. The gray water will, crip, uh, will um, will clog drip lines. So um, just to kind of illustrate this a little, let's suspend your disbelief for just a minute and pretend this is your garden. Um, if you wanted to combine rainwater and gray water in a garden like this, you might imagine having some rain barrels or tanks um, sort of accessible to those um, edible beds in the middle there um, with drip lines um, servicing those by gravity feed. And, and because those are more sensitive plants, they're edibles, they, um, rainwater works with drip. And then maybe you have a laundry to landscape system in your house um, and the laundry pump will surge that water around the perimeter where you have that vine that's much more hardy and can take sort of the surge load of gray water. So that's sort of the difference in how those two water sources are applied. So really quickly, I'll do a survey of um, reasons people harvest rainwater, and there's possibly even more, but it is a way to save money. When, you know, once you're using water that you've collected from your roof, you will see a reduction in your water bill. Unless, like some of us, it just makes you plant more, and that's fine too. Um, it, it's very nourishing for your plants. So in, in addition to other benefits, um, a lot of people don't realize it's actually the highest quality water that you can put on your garden, and you'll notice that in the health of your garden, and we'll go over that in more detail later. Um, emergency preparedness, I'll just hit that quickly now because it's not um, outlined further in the presentation, but I know emergency preparedness is on a lot of people's minds. Um, rainwater is not potable water. Um, it's collected off your roof. It's very high quality water, but it has been exposed to whatever may be on your roof um, and anything that, that it kind of picks up on its way and then it sits in storage for, it can, it can sit in storage for an extended period of time. Um, so for that reason, you don't go up to a rain tank and drink out of it. However, it's about, it would be about the same as drinking out of a creek or a stream. Um, so you can be prepared for an emergency by keeping camping gear around. Um, so, you know, standard REI gear, there's lots of ways to do that, but you can get treatment, water bottles, tablets, iodine, even bleach, boiling, any of those things could help you purify that water if you needed to drink it. 
Um, stewarding the environment, we're going to spend a good chunk of this presentation on the, on why rainwater harvesting is so good for the environment. And then increasing awareness and well-being. I mean, I really found that when I started harvesting rainwater, I really started tuning in more to, you know, I was suddenly very aware of when it was raining and the level in my tanks and that just sort of extended out to make me much more aware of weather, seasonality, and sort of the, the patterns that we experience. So jumping right in, um, detailing a little bit more about um, the environmental benefits of rainwater harvesting. And there are many and they're all interrelated. So as I start to talk about these, it's sort of like we're all telling the same story. It's just a holistic um, picture here, but we reduce the draw and stress resources. So whether you're on a well, um, and here, you know, I know people are all over the country. Here in California, we, in our recent history, have a very severe historic drought, and people were really watching levels of groundwater go down and down and down, and I know that was very scary for people who um, are on wells. And then even if you're on city water, the, that water is also coming from those shared resources and reservoirs. Um, but city water infrastructure is really expensive to replace, so, so the more we, we reduce the draw on those types of resources, you know, the less we stress those resources. Um, restoring the hydrologic cycle, that's a big one, and I have a whole slide to illustrate that. Um, reducing runoff and protect, protecting your watershed. So, you know, here in California, people are very drought-minded, water conservation-minded. Um, I know in other parts of the country, um, people think more about how do we capture runoff and control runoff. Um, those are two sides of the same coin, and even in California, um, runoff is one of the biggest environmental issues that um, delivers you know, pollution to the water waterways. Um, it's actually, EPA has designated stormwater as the greatest source of water pollution, um, period. So, so, you know, rainwater harvesting helps both sides of that equation. And then more, a little, more little known, I suppose, and this is known as the energy water nexus, um, harvesting rainwater actually helps you reduce your carbon footprint. So a lot of the climate conversation centers around carbon um, and alternative energy sources. And I think a lot of people don't realize that pumping water accounts for 20% of energy use in California. And actually, I think that's an incomplete statement. I think um, pumping, treating, heating, and transporting water is more like 26, 30% um, of energy use. So if you think about it, any Thing you do to make your water use more sustainable, reduce your draw um, on those sort of big, you know, systems with the big infrastructure, um, you are reducing your carbon footprint as well. So it's all interrelated. All right, let's go back to fourth grade for just a second. This is the global hydrologic cycle, um, and we'll do a quick review. But um, the truth is we don't have any less water on the planet than we ever did. Water is constantly cycling. Um, it evaporates, it becomes clouds, it rains back down on us, it runs over the surface of the earth into surface waters and infiltrates into the ground and the whole thing starts over again. So what's the problem, right? If, if this is still happening, it's been happening since the beginning of time and we haven't actually let any water leave our system. Well, let's look at that for a minute. And actually, let me do a check-in because what I see on my screen, I see myself in the corner and it's covering a little bit of the slide. I just want to make sure people can see, you know, the content of the slide. Liz is nodding at me, so we must be okay. Okay, so what you're looking at on the left is what rain, what precipitation does when it falls in a natural environment. And hold on, we have a couple chats. Let's just take a look at those. I think we're still good. Okay, so um, in, in nature, and it really doesn't matter whether we're talking about a forest, a chaparral, a savanna, a desert even, um, we, we have um, na the natural groundwater, I'm sorry, ground cover, when rainwater falls on it, about 40% evapotranspirates or evaporates. So that's that big arrow you see shooting up on the left. 25% is shallow infiltration and 25% deep infiltration. So you see those two, two arrows under the ground. So that means that that water is recharging groundwater about 50%. And then runoff is part of the equation in nature, but only about 10% of the water is gonna run off the surface of, of the earth and find its way to rivers and streams in a natural environment. So compare that to what you see on the right in a developed landscape, and this is, let's say, 75% impervious ground cover. Um, you've got 30% evaporation, only 10% shallow infiltration, and 5% deep infiltration. And then that runoff figure is just massive. It's 50%. So in a developed environment, we've essentially flipped the numbers on deep infiltration 
um, I'm sorry, on infiltration versus runoff. And that's why we have water shortages in our communities. And that's why we have to expend so much energy to pump water from deep underground or, tr or truck it in or whatever we're doing to get water. It's because we've paved over our landscape and we have um, limited its ability to, to process water. So let's just make that point as starkly as we can. So what do you see here? Um, Usually when I present live, I ask someone in the audience if they want to narrate this slide for me because I think you're starting to get the point by now. Um, so on the left, you can almost see that whole hydrologic cycle working right there. I mean, we have a snowpack on the mountain melting down, you know, it's creating its own weather system. You can almost feel how spongy that forest floor would be, that nice green grass on the hillside, and then water evaporating right there and creating clouds. Um, so, you know, weather really is local. People find when, when they change their activity level, um, you know, weather changes, people create, create weather. We have um, urban heat island effects and all those things. So when you actually get away into the mountains, you really observe that fresh, clean air and that just crisp feeling that, that, that you get when air is clean and water is cycling the way it should be. So what you see on the right is pretty much the opposite. Um, it's about as bad as it gets. And you know, the last slide talked about 75% impervious ground cover. This looks just about like 100% to me. So um, you know, we see a channelized stream and I'm guessing that water falling on this landscape, virtually none of it is getting under the earth. So the earth underneath that is parched and dry. And meanwhile, the people who are um, inhabiting that landscape are pumping the water out from underneath. And then um, when it does rain, a lot of pollution is generated by activities like this. This is an industrial scene. So we have all those pollutants kind of getting carried to that channelized stream and just dumping into the um, streams and oceans. So, so that's sort of the crux of the problem there. Um, this is again the hydrologic cycle and this is a image that blue barrel uses a lot so you see those same you know evaporation condensation precipitation and then what we've added here in the pink text is that you can collect and store water from your roof and that's going to help restore the infiltration link okay so this is like kind of the if you have to go to a cocktail party if you ever get to go to one again right but let's say you meet up with some friends in, on zoom next week um you're like hey i just learned this really cool thing i can actually describe now why rainwater harvesting is good for the environment it's because we send all our water away and whether i live in a climate where where water scarcity is an issue or whether we have too much runoff either way all this pavement is a problem um, so now what you see in this graphic you have a roof and you have water storage to mitigate the impacts of your own roof so that's that's what you're thinking about when you you know how can i get my land to function more like it would if there weren't all this hardscape on it um so i'll jump over a little bit to um why water is um why rainwater is so good for plants and actually before i do um i i need a sip of water but liz do we have any questions related to the last segment there not necessarily related to the last segment what's that not necessarily related to the last okay. segment. Yeah. Okay, and I know we'll hold, we'll kind of be reviewing questions at the end. So, um, why harvest rainwater, superior water source, especially for plants? Okay, so here are all the reasons why your plants are gonna love rainwater more than any other water source. Um, it's 100% soft water, so no salts, chemicals, or minerals. In that whole hydrologic cycle deal, when water evaporates off the land, it leaves all of that stuff behind, and when it rains down, it's essentially clean and clear. Um, and you know, if you're on well water, you're gonna have a pretty heavy sediment load, minerals, and if you're on city water, of course, you have the added chlorine. Um, so all of those things are kind of working against your efforts in the garden. So your gardens are really gonna appreciate the soft water. Um, rainwater collects a small amount of organic matter from the rooftop, okay? And for the most part, this is pollen, um, it's, um, squirrel tracks, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of bird stuff. It's all this stuff that, you know, these are the reasons we don't drink it, right? But all this stuff is actually very good for your garden and your garden appreciates it. It's like a light and even application of fertilizer every time you water. Um, it's slightly acidic actually. So, you know, I learned this, uh, I've learned and learned just more and more about rainwater as I've been doing this for so many years. And I learned this fact a little later in the game and I was like, what a coincidence rainwater is the perfect ph for organic gardening and then you know it hits me one day this is not a coincidence this is the water that plants have co-evolved with for ages so um you know another sort of interesting fact i learned later in the game um and usually in a live presentation i would have somebody guess and it's a lot of fun but i'm just gonna tell you um 
that city water is treated to be alkaline. So the typical pH in city water is around eight, you know, between 7.5 and eight. And that is so that it won't destroy the pipe network. So I always wondered, you know, before I started rainwater harvesting, I used to try to keep health plants um, inside and I could never keep them alive. And, you know, if, it, I, suddenly I developed a green thumb when I started um, watering house plants with rainwater. So if you picture a potted plant, really, you know, all that stuff you're putting in it from the water can't escape that soil. It just kind of sort of accumulates in the soil and gets stuck there. So um, if you're harvesting rainwater and you can't do a huge system to service your whole garden, think about using it for house plants or the, you know, the plants that are going to benefit the most from it. Um, rainwater also contains nitrates, which is the bioavailable form of nitrogen. So again, no coincidence, it's just the water that has co-evolved to be um, best for plants. So again, um, this picture was taken in a greenhouse and you see th that's the prototype for the blue barrel system. Behind that, this was at Indian Valley Farm and Garden in Novato. Um, and we, we used that water inside, you know, it was a farm. We, we'll talk a little bit more about numbers and proportions. We were not harvesting enough water to keep a farm irrigated and that's usually not what you would do, but we had water right there at the greenhouse to use on the plant starts. And it is those young plants, the sensitive plants that are gonna benefit the most from um, that high quality water. All right, um, I'm gonna draw some definitions here between active and passive rainwater harvesting. So um, passive rainwater harvesting is simply using earthworks, the shape of the earth, to help slow and spread and sink water on your landscape. So you can get started with rainwater harvesting with just a shovel, really. It's a whole way of thinking. You need to look at your landscape and see how the water is sheeting off of different surfaces. So not only a roof, but is it sheeting off of a lawn, a driveway? Um, and how do you kind of direct that water to a place where it can infiltrate into the ground? That's the whole point. So passive rainwater harvesting utilizes landform and other natural barriers to stop or slow the flow of water across a landscape so that it can infiltrate and recharge groundwater. And as you see, those systems um, can't, the, a passive system can be very beautiful. Um, I, I don't know why I didn't choose a prettier picture of tanks. I guess I was just trying to draw a stark um, difference, but active is, um, so, so the difference um, is that with active, you're actually storing it in tanks so that you can control how the water is reused. So both are excellent for the environment. Passive is probably less expensive, depending on your vision for what you want to do, um, and, and doesn't take all the inputs. It doesn't take a lot of materials. It really can be as simple as starting to dig and you know, loosen up your soil and figuring out how to direct that water um, into infiltration basins and swales and mulch basins, rain gardens. You've heard a lot of words before, probably, that all refer to these passive systems. Um, with um, with active systems, the difference is you get to control then. You have stored water now and you control how you use it. So I'll highlight a few kind of examples of passive systems. And these are from Brad Lancaster's books. I highly recommend Brad Lancaster. And he's on my resource slide at the end of this presentation. That picture in the upper left is showing sort of a typical landscape. And most suburban environments are really carefully designed to shed water towards the gutter and the street. Um, and that's so, you know, you don't want to ruin your building foundation, that makes sense, but um, we're sending all that, all that water away. And there's, there's sort of a cultural value, I think, of, of planting trees on mounds. Um, if, you, if you studied a lot of sort of sustainability measures and a lot of the ideas Daily Acts have promoted, we just need to change our thinking that things that are plantings need to be in sunken basins so that water can get in. So that's what you see more. Um, the idea is run on instead of run off, right? Um, and that's what you see on the lower right. So I love it that we have people from all over the country and um, I get, you know, the, the caption on this slide, is this water conservation or is it stormwater mitigation? Well, you know, it's really both. So here are examples from Portland, Oregon, which is a very wet part of the country versus Tucson, Arizona, about as dry as it gets. Um, and you see the same strategies used in both places. So in Portland, what you're looking at there is a curb cut and there, you know, the city was mostly motivated by stormwater impacts to do that, but they have dry summers there too. So they're able to keep these sort of non-irrigated vegetated strips to beautify the edge of the streets there and those curb cuts let the water in from the street. So it can be as simple as that. You're just creating a place for the water to flow and get to plants and earth. Um, and then the example in Tucson, this is actually from Brad Lancaster and this was his house. Um, the, the picture 
kind of the inset picture um, that shows the dry landscape is what that used to look like when he bought it, I think in 1990. And this is Tucson, Arizona. This is a non-irrigated landscape. So they did the same thing by just kind of um, using curb cuts and getting banking the road to get the water into those. Um, and they obviously use climate appropriate planting. So those are, you know, desert appropriate edible plants. And they have this beautiful um, walkway where there once was just sort of barrenness. And this example I love, this is um, from Village Homes in Davis. And you might not know what you're looking at. It looks like a pretty landscape, but this is a development that was built, I think in 1976. And there's kind of a fun story that goes along with it. And um, it's a 90 acre development. And they, at that time, were experimenting with pretty much every sustainable building technique they could think of. So you see a lot of 70s vintage solar panels and sunrooms and all kinds of things there. Um, but the other thing they did, they designed the entire development with no storm drains. So the whole place is landscaped as a network of what you see here. So you have raised pathways and then you have these sort of rocky beds here and there and it's all vegetated and beautiful. And you can walk through there and not really realize it's anything particularly special. But um, the architects submitted their plans to the city and the city said, no way, you got to put storm drains in. So they, you know, they came back and, you know, ultimately they came to an agreement. They kind of said, you know, this is the whole point where, you know, that we're not this is a water neutral situation. Um, so the city made them put, the, the number, they said $100,000 performance bond. That sounds like not very much these days. Maybe that was a lot in 1976. But they had to put a big performance bond um, on, on it. And then what happened the very next year, the city got a hundred year storm, the city system backed up and village homes drained the whole town. So they got all that money back the very next year. But I just think that's such a fun story because this isn't rocket science, right? It's, this is landform, that's all it is. And we just have to change our thinking about these systems. So we're gonna get into um, the active side of things, which is water storage. Um, and again, to ponder are some climates more suited to rainwater harvesting than others. When I started studying this, I, I did, you know, this was back in 2006 and I did an intensive course in um, Arizona, in Northern Arizona. And that's where I met Brad Lancaster. Um, but uh, it, w later on, I went to grad school to another sustainable design program, and this was in Western Massachusetts. And I was so excited to learn, you know, how these different techniques we would use in a different climate. And I was just amazed over and over again to learn that the techniques are the same. The water, the water cycle is the same, no matter where you are. And what rainwater harvesting is really about um, is restoring that water cycle. So here we have images from Texas, California, big and small systems, Maryland, and I'm showing kind of a range of different systems here. Um, so let's see. I'm gonna go over quickly the anatomy of a rainwater catchment system. Um, there's lots of ways you can go about actually building them and they just need a few key parts. Um, so conduit, so we'll go kind of from top to bottom. We're starting with your roof and the conduit just refers to the way you get the water into the barrel, so, or the tanks. So um, most people have a gutter system on their house already. Gutter downspout, that is conduit. Um, some people craft something using PVC or if you're taking water farther away, um, you can build a conduit to get to your barrels or tanks. Um, first flush, I put a big question mark there and I'm not gonna get into it in detail, but I'll tell you I have an article on um, at bluebarrelsystems.com about it and you can use the search function to find it. Um, first flush is what you see there. You see a little pipe coming down, going into a small bucket right next to the house. So the idea there is that you would have some sort of diversion that the first water, you know, if you've had a long hot summer and then suddenly it starts raining again, that first flush of rain, it's gonna be the dirtiest water that you get all season. So the idea is to divert that away from the tanks and then those sediments sink to the bottom and then cleaner water um, spills over into the tank itself. Sounds awesome, right? Well, it turns out um, I don't recommend those. Um, and for a lot of reasons, most professionals don't. Um, they tend to be a weak point in the system and they, um, they cause more problems than they create. And if they're not sort of intensively managed, they can really make the problem worse. Um, the beauty of rainwater harvesting is it tends to be a very low maintenance system. So you wanna keep it that way. Um, there is code that dictates that you have to, water has to pass through 16th inch mesh. I'll show you this in more detail later, but um, what you do instead, the next item is inlet filter. So code requires an inlet filter. Water has to pass through 16th inch mesh, and that's the same as like a window screen. So if you have old window screen lying around, that's what we're talking about. 
Um, first flush is not required. So you can get into long debates about this one. And if you want to know what I really think, read the blog. Um, but um, inlet, inlet filter is what you really need to keep, you know, stuff that's big enough to create clogs or growth in your barrels will be kept out by the inlet filter. Um, the inlet just refers to the actual hose that takes the water into the barrel or tank. Storage, obviously, is a barrel or tank itself. Um, vents, every system has to be vented. Um, a multi-barrel system like Blue Barrel does, we have a vent on every barrel, because if you think about it, though, if the water can't rise up into the barrels, it's just trapping air. Um, um, some systems, if you have a big enough inlet, can actually vent through the inlet because you're never going to have the water bubbling through at full capacity. Um, but vent is really important and those vents have to be screened. So not only the inlet filter, but every opening on a rainwater catchment system has to be screened with 16th inch mesh. Um, the main reason for that actually is to keep mosquitoes away. So a lot of people wonder, you know, how do you keep mosquitoes out of these systems? And it's, you just don't, you never have an open um, storage container. So everything has to be covered with, with 16th inch mesh. Outlet just refers to how you're getting the water out. It could be a spigot, it could be a drain valve, it could be both. Um, lots of systems have many outlets. And then the overflow is that pipe you see coming off um, to the right. I don't know if the labels are big enough to read, um, but in this picture what we're showing you is an overflow kind of being directed to a sunken basin around a tree. So ideally you find um, it, you know, a, a productive use for that overflow. And we'll go over um, numbers in a minute, but a lot of people here in California think, well, I'm not gonna have an overflow. I'm not even gonna fill this barrel, but that is the farthest, spoiler alert, that is the farthest thing from the truth. So, um, so thinking about where that overflow is gonna go is important. And um, this is where you can start thinking about combining active and passive. So you can have um, a storage system and then direct your overflow into a rain garden or a place where that water can infiltrate into the ground. And then I put foundation there in parentheses because it's not um, a core part of the system foundation, but it's really important. Water is very heavy. A 55 gallon barrel alone when full is going to weigh close to 500 pounds. Um, so you want to put your system on something solid. And I usually recommend, um, you know, if you're working on bare soil, use something like base rock, like a three quarter inch crush. Um, you don't want to use sand because just imagine, and I've seen people do sand foundations. And I don't, but here's what happens. You know, the, the tank itself creates its own little watershed. So it's raining on the tank and that water's all coming down and the thing starts kind of um, sinking into the sand. So the, the rule of thumb is if you go to the landscape store and you're picking out um, a gravel base rock, you'd want to hold it in your hand. And if, if the rocks roll around, it's not going to hold something level and steady. So you want a real crushed, jagged thing. Um, uh, decomposed granite works. That's a more expensive material, but probably the, the most basic, most inexpensive thing you can use is blue shell crush. It's also called road base. It's just standard crush rock. So I'm going to go over a whole bunch of examples now so you can start to get your head around different ways um, active systems can look. Um, I'll pause for a second. Liz, are there any questions we want to stop and answer? Uh, let's see. Todd actually has a question that comes up pretty frequently for us. You might be going into detail later on in the slide, but he asked, does the water from different material roofs need to be treated differently? Okay, that's a good question. I will answer that quickly now because I don't have that specifically in the slide. Um, so the good news is there are very few roof surfaces that are true no-nos, and I'll list them. You, you don't want to collect off a copper roof. Um, copper is an herbicide, so um, so, and, and, and the rainwater is acidic, so it will kind of pull, pull that out of it. Um, you don't want to collect off of cedar shake, so wood shingles, anything that's treated with fire retardants. Those are um, not really going to be healthy to, to put into your soils and your plants if you can avoid it. The, you know, most people wonder, you know, the big question is the asphalt shingle because that's what most of us have, right? Um, um, and asphalt shingle is fine. So asphalt is actually inert. It's completely inert. Um, the, what's not inert are the glues that are used to install the roofing material. So um, the standard recommendation is if you're irrigating edibles, and only if you're irrigating edibles do you have to worry about this, um, don't irrigate off a brand new roof. So that glue is going to do almost all of its off-gassing um, within a year and virtually all of it within three years. So if, you're, if your asphalt shingle roof is more than three years old, you have virtually no concern even with irrigating edibles. And let me explain a little more about edibles. Um, you know, there's different kinds of edibles, right? So any fruiting plant, including tomatoes, eggplants, obviously fruit trees, 
you can, you can water that stuff with pretty contaminated water. There's no uptake into the fruit itself. Um, so, so there's sort of levels of safety, right? Anything like lettuce and greens where you're actually eating the greens, the greens also don't absorb it, but you want to wash it, right? And that's always the case. You want to wash wash that off. Um, it's it's like the root crops, like carrots, that are actually going to be um, taking up um, more of what's in the water. So again, it's really only a concern if you have a, a brand new roof. Um, the other thing to consider with the the asphalt shingle roofs is that gravelly stuff that's on it. Um, and again, that I'll show you this later, but this is going to go a million miles in keeping all that out of your system. So. Um, so yeah, great question. And um, again, if you go to bluebarrelsystems.com and type in the surf search bar roofing, you can find a lot more information about that. Um, if you're starting from scratch and you have an unlimited budget, think about that. Um, you, uh, standing seam metal is the best. It's it's clean, it's coated with an enamel and it, um, it it's highly efficient. So other roof surfaces, you're gonna get maybe like between 85 and 90% collection efficiency um, as uh, the, the standing seam metal is more like 95% collection efficiency. So if you're doing a big system, that matters. If you're doing what most of us do, it, the collection efficiency is a non-issue. So I hope I hope that um, kind of touches on that enough. Um, and we'll start looking at some of these actual systems. So these are just examples of standard rain barrels. So we'll start small here. Um, the one on the left is a prefab one, and the one on the right is an example of one that somebody may have built themselves. Um, so you see all those kind of anatomy pieces that we mentioned. It looks like the one on the left has screen over the top and you see those taps and spigots. You don't always see the overflows. Um, and so, you know, honestly, sometimes prefab systems are not well designed. I wouldn't be surprised if that one on the left doesn't have an overflow and the plan is that it just spills over. That's possible. Um, maybe there's a hidden overflow in the back, but it doesn't, doesn't really look like it, does it? Um, these are examples of daisy chain systems. So the one in the middle is a picture I pulled off the internet. And I think most people, when they start thinking about increasing their capacity by linking barrels together, um, you come up with something kind of like you see in the middle there. So I think those barrels are linked. They have hoses running between them near the top. And what you see is a spigot on every barrel. So water's going in that first barrel. When the first barrel fills, it overflows into the next and into the next. And then ideally they have a system overflow um, somewhere there. I think I see it actually on the upper left. Um, but what you notice is they have a tap on every barrel. Um, what Blue Barrel does, we, we also do a multi-barrel system. Our design is very different. We're actually the only system on the market um, that is plumbed from underneath. So you don't actually see the plumbing very well in these pictures because it's hidden underneath those cinder blocks. But the barrels go on a double cinder block footing and then the pipe runs underneath them. And sort of the trick, this is where I like to have fun with the audience again if I could actually see you. but. Um, but um, you know, I let people kind of kind of guess how, how this actually works. But I'm just going to tell you. So you you only need one inlet to service this whole system. Now that one on the lower right is 42 barrels, and they're all connected. And you'll see they're doubled up in places where that fence contours. Um, so there's a whole network of a simple network of plumbing underneath um, that services all those barrels. So water goes in through the first barrel, and then they're all the the underpipe floods, and they're all gonna fill and empty together. Um, so it's a way to get a whole bunch of barrels to work like one big tank. Um, and then it means you only need one. You don't need a spigot on every barrel. You don't need to manage, move hoses and worry about which barrels are full and which ones are empty and all of that. So it's a totally self-managing um, design and um, virtually self-cleaning as well because the sediments that do get through that 16th inch mesh are flushing right through rather than collecting at the bottom, which does happen. You will get a sediment layer um, if, you, if you're tapping the barrels sort of six to 12 inches off the bottom like you typically see. Um, it, it's also difficult to access the water in the bottom if you're tapping the barrel on the side. This is a larger scale low tech system. So it's very similar to the rain barrel picture we just looked at, it's just a bigger vessel. So you can see um, here the picture on the left, um, the person's drawing from both sides of the roof and they've kind of, um, they, that's, so that's the conduit, right? And they're bringing their water together and into the tank. Um, and then uh, you can see that that little hole you see near the top of the black tank, that is an overflow port. So they should probably eventually put some piping there and direct that somewhere productive. And I can't 
and again, I can't see what's on the right of the screen, but that's okay. Um, just more examples. Um, now here's an example of commercial high tech. This is a system, um, the, the one that's in the colored rendering, this is at UC Davis and it's a viticulture facility so that they actually collect all the processed water um, for all the wine processing. So, you know, water doesn't go into the wine. Um, I don't think it ever does. I'm not an expert on winemaking, but this is all the water they use for cleaning the facility and the processed water and the cooling and all of those things that they have to do. So um, that is six 100,000 gallon tanks. Um, that system really exists and it was sort of a, I think a viticulture professor that backed that project and got all the donations and, you know, he, or got the whole project funded and he's from Australia and now Australia is miles ahead of the USA in terms of understanding that rainwater harvesting can be a real industrial level, municipal level water provision. Here in the United States, you don't get a lot of recognition of that, um, you know, amongst water providers. So. Um, when we think about sustainable water, um, we do have examples all over the globe. Actually, I, lots of island nations are also heavily invested in rainwater because they can't pump from underground because they get saltwater um, intrusion. So there's plenty of examples worldwide for us to look to of rainwater harvesting being employed in a big way. Um, here are, this is what underground tanks look like. Now, um, we get the question at Blue Barrel quite frequently, can I bury these things? Um, you can do underground storage, but not with Blue Barrels and not even with, um, not with a big sort of well water tank either. So what you notice about these tanks is that they're, they have kind of a special quality to them and they're specifically engineered to withstand the soil load. So a tank, like if you used a well tank um, on, and buried it, it would crush under the load of soil. And then the other feature of these, um, they're actually, um, the, what you do is you dig out your hole and you have to pour concrete under, under there and you have to ballast them down. Because um, what happens is, if your tanks are empty and the groundwater level rises, these will float, they'll surface. So um, this is not an inexpensive project. This is a highly engineered project. And then of course, unless you're on a mountainside where you can somehow bury a tank above where you're using the water, um, you have to pump the water back out again, of course. So this is no small deal. Um, I've never built one myself, but I, I can tell you a little bit about it. So um, if, if you're thinking of burying tanks, you gotta start thinking, big like this and you want to make sure you're using tanks that are designed for that. Um, this is kind of a cool approach. Um, this is called matrix storage and it's also an underground storage mechanism but these are almost like milk crate type things and the idea is you can create any shape storage you want. So these people create a dugout and they line it with a pond liner um, and then they just kind of create the structure um, with this porous milk crate type thing, whatever shape they want, and then um, they bury it all and you can store water in there. Um, you can also use these for passive storage. You can, if, if you just want to infiltrate water on your site, you can skip the pond liner and just use this as a way to, in, you know, make, make capacity for water underground. And here's another approach. This is called a rainwater pillow. Um, so these are made of, you know, military grade material. They're seam sealed and they're pretty much indestructible. Um, but something like this, you could put in a basement or a crawl space to store water under your house. So again, you'd have to pump it out. Um, but this is kind of a creative and unique way to do it. But all of these things I'm showing you have those same simple, that anatomy list I showed you, they all have the same features. So that kind of um, does it for different ways to harvest rainwater. I'm gonna get into sizing. Um, so a lot of people are like, yeah, this is cool. I'm gonna do it now. How much storage do I need? So we're gonna get into that. Um, do I need to pause for another question, Liz? We have a few questions regarding, you know, how to get your water from the barrel to whatever area you're trying to irrigate. One person has, um, their property will have to be downhill and the rainwater would have to be downhill. So how do they get it to where they want it to be? And then another person asks, do you need to get a pump to move that water from the barrels? Okay, so maybe, you know, maybe in the end, we, we're going to cover this later on. Um, ideally, you can use gravity to your favor, but some people can't. So when you, if you just don't have the right setup to um, have distribute water with gravity, which, and actually, if you have a flat site, you can distribute with gravity um, in a limited way. So I'll tell you now, so that we don't glaze over it later, um, that we have a very detailed blog on our website about this, um, bluebarrelsystems.com, and type gravity-fed irrigation, or just irrigation, it'll come up. 
um, and we have some really good information about what you need to understand about levels and distances and things like that if you're going to do gravity fed drip. Um, and, and I do have a video I'm planning to show. We're going to see if we have time. And I think I'm going to give you guys a choice about what we do. But one of the things we may be able to highlight at the end um, is kind of a show and tell of a gravity fed setup. So it sounds like that might be of interest today. So we'll get back to that. Um, so we'll talk about sizing. Um, there's three things you need to consider so, and, and in this order. So first is how much can I catch based on my catchment surface? Um, the second is how much am I going to use? And then the third, and honestly, you know, some people get really overwhelmed thinking about those first two, and I'm going to kind of demystify that a little bit. Most of us are constrained by budget or space or both. And if that's the case for you, you're just gonna do however many you can fit. And the beauty of it is you don't have to overthink it. Um, the environmental uh, benefits of rainwater harvesting are so great that no matter what little bit you do um, is helping. And, and you'll see, and don't be discouraged if that means one rain barrel, two rain barrels, because you'll see that the smaller your system is, the more recharges you're gonna get in a year. So it's not as simple as I have 50 gallons of storage and that's how much I save in a year. You're gonna multiply that benefit the more you use that water. So we'll kind of go over some of this logic. Um, the picture you see on the left is that original prototype for the blue barrel system. Trust me, we've learned a lot since then. So we have a much better designed, easy to install thing, but you know, you're welcome, right? We, <laughs> we <laughs> learn the hard way. That's the only way I ever learn. Um, but that system is 22 barrels on the greenhouse. Um, and uh, that's basically how many we could fit in that corridor, but it's also sized, um, it's about 1500 gallons and it's sized to harvest um, four inches of rain off of that half of the greenhouse roof, which I think is 1200 square feet. Um, so we figured this is in Nevada, California, four inches is like the biggest storm you could ever imagine. And we knew we would be uh, using the water in between. So you don't wanna oversight, you don't wanna go overboard. You know, you'll get overwhelmed in a good way, right? When you see just how much water comes off your roof, it doesn't mean you need to go buy a 200,000 gallon, gallon tank, okay? So think, if you think about it more practically, you're gonna be using that water um, in between, you're gonna get multiple recharges. Um, and if you direct that overflow into an infiltration basin, you're virtually handling you know, your water anyway. Um, Figuring out how much you use is a little harder. Um, we'll go over that a little. The picture on the right, so this was in another, in the early days of experimentation, but that's a house I used to live in in Sonoma County. And we had space for two barrels there between the house and the fence. Um, and what, there's a door just, you know, to the right off the picture, that was our back door. And then on the other side of the fence is where we parked the cars and there's no garage or car covering. So in the winter, we would walk right by that system on the way out to the cars and fill up a bucket and defrost the windshield. So we were, it was raining all winter. We were using the water all winter. I have no idea how much we collected. It was just like a continual use and recharge, use and recharge. And then when summer hit, you know, these are these are drought tolerant grasses in front of them. So we could irrigate them for a good little while. But of course, you know, the water did run out um, at a certain point and then we would just switch back to regular irrigation. So, you know, I try to encourage people to just start, you know, you don't, you can start small and sometimes that's the best way to start um, because you don't want to overthink it and talk yourself out of it. Like the, you'll start seeing the benefits, understanding how everything works and then understand how, I mean, I found ways to expand systems later that I wouldn't have thought of to begin with. So sometimes you have to just get your feet wet with it. Um, so with sizing, you, the key thing to figure out for how much you can catch from your roof is how big is your roof. Um, the cool thing is there's no trigonometry involved. The pitch of your roof does not matter. It's you're simply calculating the size of the footprint. So if you think about it, how much land area does your roof cover? And that's how much um, that's the measurement you're taking. So what this slide is showing you is that these three dramatically different roof lines um, actually have the same surface area. And then of course, um, if, if you're harvesting from a downspout, the exercises go look at the downspout, look up, and then identify kind of the roof, the, the area of drainage, because most people are not harvesting from their whole roof. They're gonna um, find a downspout where they have some space, and then um, that's the section of roof that you're, that you're measuring. So you're really just worried about the flat area. So that means um, there are a bunch of easy ways to calculate that. Um, here is an example. This is a real installation we did. Um, and you'll see these people have the half of their house is about 700 square feet. Um, and they only had room for three barrels there. And then half the garage, 200 square feet, they had room for six barrels there. So you'd think, well, 
well, you know, why not more barrels with more surface area? But the truth that you can't, it's going to come down to where you have space for the barrels. And the, the truth, the, well, I'll, I'll go over the math in just a second to show you how quickly these systems fill. So you really don't have to overthink that. In fact, if you have a garden shed, you know, some of you who might be thinking, well, my house is downhill from my garden and I'm going to have to pump the water. Do you have a shed in your garden? Because that might generate enough water to keep your barrels fill, full. So just, you know, start thinking that way. Um, so we'll go deeper into the numbers here. And, you know, what you see in this picture, obviously the yellow is outline of the roof segment that we're measuring. Um, the red star is where the downspout is. So you kind of just go find the downspout and then the blue represents the barrels. So I know that, you know, we glaze over with the math. This is really easy math and I'm gonna actually make it even simpler than it shows here. But all you need to know to do this calculation is a, a rainfall figure. So you can calculate by storm or use an annual average, which we have here. So that picture was from Davis, California, where the average annual rainfall is pretty low. It's about 20 inches. So the first thing you do is convert inches to feet. And once you have your rainfall in feet, we have uh, 0.67 feet of rain. You can multiply that by your square footage figure to get your um, water volume in cubic feet. So we have 1,169 cubic feet of water coming off of that 700 uh, square foot pitch. Um, and then <laughs> And then multiply that by 7.48. 7.48 is the conversion factor to get cubic feet back to gallons. For those of you who don't use Google, right? <laughs> so, um, so that that 700 square foot pitch in dry Davis, California, is going to give these homeowners, you know, eight and a half thousand gallons of water a year. So, you know, either way, that three barrel, that six barrel system is completely eclipsed by the amount of. of um, of water that's available. So, so for, for people in dry climates, start thinking this, this, is, this is realistic. A lot of people in dry climates are stuck on, we don't have enough water to harvest. And that is never true, not even in Tucson. So make the whole thing easier. The conversion factor is 0.623 gallons per square foot of rooftop per inch of rain. And if you wanna make it even easier, you can just use 0.6. Okay, you're always gonna have, these figures are all guesstimates. You don't really know how much rain you're gonna get. You're gonna get a little bit of splash off, the collection efficiency of your roof, whatever. So 0 0.6, you can, if you can remember that, 0 0.6 gallons per square foot per inch. Um, and then this just il illustrates um, backwards. So you take that whole thing backwards, the 180 gallons, that's the three barrel system. Um, do all the math backwards, and you'll see that's gonna fill with less than half an inch off of that um, rooftop and potential to recharge 49 times in an average year. So that's a lot of refill and recharge. It's a lot of water. And then here's the math on the other system, which is collecting off of 2,000, uh, sorry, 200 square feet only, half of a garage with six barrels. So that one's going to fill with two and a half inches of rain off that tiny surface and get seven to eight recharges per year. Okay. This is a cool tool and I put it in the resources section. This is this website's called permadesign.com and they have a free rainwater harvesting calculator where you can enter your address. And unfortunately I used a picture of a commercial building. It's more fun when you do your house, but you can, it has a tool where you can trace the roof lines and it'll give you the square footage of those sections. So that's probably the easiest way to get a square footage reading. Um, and then you can take that square footage, and this is a rainwater calculator that's on Blue Barrel's website, um, and you can put it uh, into a rainwater calculator. So you don't even, if you can't remember 0.6, just use a rainwater calculator. But what this screen is telling us is that a 400 square foot roof surface will fill 660 gallons with 2.75 inches of rainfall. So 660 gallons is a 12 barrel system. So it, you know, does not take a lot to fill um, quite a lot of storage. So, okay, now that I've convinced you, you have enough water and you don't really have to pay enough attention or you don't have to pay a whole lot of attention to that part, it's fun to do the calculations, so do it, but that's not the part of this project that you have to get stuck on, right? Does everyone kind of understand that? 
Um, so next thing people wonder, well, how much does my garden use? Well, that's a harder question to answer. Um, so if you pay attention, you know, if you live in a dry climate where you have hot, dry summers, you can pay attention to your water bill in um, summer versus winter to try to guesstimate how much water you're using in irrigation. But um, really, when you're harvesting rainwater, you only, if, if your goal is to water a segment of your garden, um, all summer long, then you only need to identify your longest dry stretch. And even a little bit of rain um, late in the season is going to give you a big recharge. So that's when the clock starts. Um, so, so what we see, you know, I used examples from Davis, so I'm going to stay consistent with that here. Um, but the precipitation graph on the right, that green line is nationwide. So I know some of you are joining us from all over the country. Now you're very lucky in other parts of the country where you have summer storms and you have pretty even distribution of rainfall throughout spring, summer, and fall. Um, and that's the case for most of the country. In those areas, you get really high utility out of a, out of a small system. We saw a lot of two four barrel systems um, on the East Coast, the Midwest, um, in the South where they have um, you know, rain, rainfall all year round because, you know, you're just irrigating for short, short segments between rains. Um, it's here in the West where we have that long, hot, dry summer where you're paying a little bit more attention um, to how long your dry season is. So in the West, again, I would say a small system is still worthwhile. You can focus that water on, um, on your house plants, on your young plants. You can designate a very small area of your garden to use it on. Um, you can switch back to your regular water once you run out of rainwater. So there's lots of ways you can manage that. Um, but if your goal is to kind of irrigate for the whole summer, um, you're looking at that flat line at the bottom of the red line where, okay, when's the last rain and when's the first rain? So you're never really gonna know. It can be a very long time, but I love telling this story because it's the year Blue Barrel launched, 2012 going into the driest year on record in California, tail end of a like very scary six year historic drought. Um, we had a rain on June 26th, which was really late. So we had just done a workshop and installed a 12 barrel system in Windsor um, and they, it, it was May. So we didn't expect that the system would fill until fall. We got a late rain June 26th, it filled. And then the first rain in the fall came on September 6th, which was super early. People think I'm like a, a photographic memory because I have these, but that like, it was just so amazing. I've memorized those numbers. So we had a very, even the driest year on record in California, we had a very short, like long stretch, if that makes sense. So people who were harvesting water at that time had a really effective, year that year. So um, we'll go over some more pretty pictures. These are all blue barrel systems and just to demonstrate sort of the range of creativity you can take with these. So they can be small or they can be large. Um, the, the two barrel system is the smallest you can do with the under plum design. Um, there are kits you can use for a single barrel if that's all you want. But um, if you're doing the under plumbing, it's all about how the barrels are linked at the bottom. Um, and then the one on the right is the biggest single system that I'm aware of that one of our customers has ever done. And that's a 42 barrel system. So they can be any color. We get this question a lot. Why are the barrels blue? And there's a simple answer for that. Um, our whole business is um, is built around the idea of repurposing barrels from the waste stream and food blue is industry standard for food grade. Um, so that and they're used so you know we're not selling these for potable water but using a high quality drum is important because it's going to be exposed to the sun you want that water to stay um, kind of clean and safe. So these are UV resistant made of food grade plastic. Um, what they, they do come in other colors. We don't recommend using the white ones because they're not UV resistant. So you'll get a lot of algae growth in those. These barrels that you see in this picture are painted. So if you can paint them out any color you want, you just kind of sand the surface and paint them with an outdoor rated um, spray paint. So this guy matched them to, uh, matched them to his house. Um, so if you see them in other colors, what we recommend is painting them, you know, start blue and paint if that's what you want to do. They can round corners, so this is a very flexible design. The system is also in the town of Windsor, um, and it, it rounds the corner of a garden shed. And they can collect from many downspouts. So what you're seeing here, all of these systems are on one house. Um, the one, the two pictures on the left are kind of the same setup from two different directions. And you'll see the picture on the far left, 
Um, this guy wanted to put his barrels along the fence, not along the house. So he built a little archway over the top and that black pipe you see there that he kind of, he used two inch ABS to kind of rebuild the downspout um, and drop it down over next to the barrels. So that's, that's conduit and that's one thing you can do if you want to kind of have that water travel a little farther. As long as you're not asking the water to go uphill, you can take it really far. You can take it all the way across um, a garden if you want. And then um, he actually connected them underground. So that picture in the middle, you see there's some barrels on the right and some on the left. That's all one system and he, they're connected underground. And so the water levels in all of them. So the important thing with um, a setup like that, the whole thing has to be level. So if you wanna connect them underground, if system number one, if, if that first set of barrels is higher up than the second one, nothing's gonna fill higher than the top of the lowest barrel, if that makes sense, because the water's gonna leak out the vents on the lowest barrel. So you always want, you know, a multi-barrel setup, you want the barrels to be level. And then um, the picture on the right is, you know, they already had concrete there, so there wasn't much they had to do. Um, oh, one more thing about the left, you can see there's a couple different kinds of, um, of rock on the bottom there. He had pea gravel already on the side and pea gravel is a round rock that's not going to hold stable with weight on it. So they dug out some of the pea gravel and threw some of the base rock down. And, that, so, um, and, and then obviously if you have concrete already, that's not necessary at all. Um, they can flex around obstacles. So these folks left a gap. Um, you know, you can, you can play with that spacing as much as you need to to get around things. And they can be customized to any site. So um, picture on the upper right is showing another thing you can do if you're farther away from your downspout. That's just a standard kind of longer hose extension. Um, the picture on the lower right is showing a couple different spigots. That's actually the house I used to live in and we, we stuck an extra spigot just towards the back door there so that don't have to put your shoes on if you want to go get some water for the house plants kind of thing. Um, the, picture on the bottom left is under a deck and we actually planned to put 10 barrels there and then there was a big tree root that got in our way so we did nine instead um, but you can see you can kind of stick them anywhere those are um, under a deck so they're completely out of sight and then this one on the upper left this guy did a beautiful job he's down in southern california and he actually did three separate systems all around the house and we have a big blog on our website highlighting his systems because he did a bunch of kind of creative things that have inspired a lot of people so um so we wanted to highlight that one um and then this one's actually the same house that had the under deck system they did nine under the deck and ten along the side so there's a lot you can do with it um so we're, we're kind of through the presentation. There's a couple other things I want to show you. These are resources and I know, um, you know, this presentation will be available um, afterwards. So you don't have to memorize this, but I suppose you could screenshot it. But the American Rainwater Catchment Systems Association, if you really want to geek out, they have a lot of studies. They um, have an annual conference. They license professionals. Um, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands is Brad Lancaster's series, and he's in, uh, based in Tucson, Arizona, but he writes really accessible material, both for passive and active rainwater catchment systems, if you want to have a book, you know, a reference book. Um, and then Blue Barrel, of course, we have lots of free resources for DIY, DIYers. You can search just about any topic of interest, you know, roofing materials, first flush, drip irrigation, and find um, detailed articles about all those aspects of the system. Um, we do have mail order kits. Um, and you know, of course, the sizing calculator. And then that link at the bottom is that really cool sizing calculator um, that lets you actually trace your roof um, segments. So um, that's all I got for slides. Um, maybe we should check in for questions and then um, we're actually gonna run a little poll to see who's interested. There's a few things we can do um, between a video and a show and tell of some parts and just more time for Q&A. But I think we're pretty good on time, aren't we, Liz? Yeah, we're doing great on time. We actually have still an hour left. It's only 7.30 right now. Well, then we'll probably get through it all. It was, gonna be, it was going to be fun to do the poll. Maybe we can poll for which one we do first. Because I know I don't always last all the way through webinars when I'm on the other side of these things. Yeah, <laughs> um, so do, can we do a quick review for questions and see what's coming up for people? Yeah, I'm going to go. Let's see. So there are a few questions specific for some folks, but maybe we can just answer those quickly. We have Abigail asking, um, heard no copper roof or 90 year old oxidized copper gutters from a tile roof as bad. 
Okay, no, I mean, that's a good question. So um, probably not. So the, the conduit system, the water does not spend a lot of time in the conduit system. The roof surface is large, the water rolls off it, especially when it first starts to rain. So if you have copper gutters, probably not as big of a deal, but I would say for anyone who has any concern about their roof water, you can collect a sample from your downspout and send it to a local lab, or there's even home test kits. If you know what you're looking for, we have a blog on that too, home testing. So, um, so test, you know, if, if you need peace of mind, you don't trust what I said on the asphalt shingle, um, test, test um, your water and see what's in it. Um, another thing you can do, um, you know, there are rooftop coatings. It's probably, if you have a beautiful copper roof, you don't want to coat it, but um, you can coat the inside of your gutters. That's not as difficult. So if you have very old, aged copper gutters, that's something to consider. Um, you can paint, paint that surface um, so that the water's not exposed to it. So that's what I'd say about that. Awesome, thank you. We have another question from Leslie Lee. Hi, Leslie. She asks, uh, can rain barrels be attached to drip or can I just use a hose from the barrel system? Yes, so drip is what we highly recommend. And actually, you know, when we first started in 2012, we were really just selling the equipment to make um, the rain barrel systems. But quickly, we sort of have developed a subspecialty in the last few years on gravity fed drip because that's the next question that comes up is how to, I can tell we're going to need to watch this little video. We'll, we'll show you a video on that, Leslie. Yeah, excellent. Another question from Leslie is, are there professionals in Santa Rosa who can assess property and do an installation? My initial thought was the Quell resource, but maybe you have some other suggestions. Yeah, check Quell. Interestingly, um, the, it's hard to find professionals to install. Um, and and Blue Barrel has, um, you could try, um, you know, I don't want to get too locally on this because we have people from all over the place. You could try permaculture artisans. They, you know, they do larger um, landscape design and they're, they're, you could, you know, Google around and see what you can find. Um, but it, you know, Blue Barrel is really focused on making this accessible for the DIYer. Um, for, for us, it's, it, you know, we consider it sort of an intermediate DIY project and then the instructions are simple enough and easy enough to follow. Most of our customers say it's easier than they thought, but um, we say hire a local handy person because you know if you're not comfortable with those directions, somebody who at least has a comfort level with building and pipes and stuff would have no problem with it. So um, yeah, that, that's what I would say on that. That's great. And uh, actually the Quell website is national too. So I, was, I took a look at it earlier and there are different uh, experts and professionals in many different states. So it might be a good resource. That's UWEL for everybody. That's a, it's basically like a training program for water professionals. Yeah, qualified water efficient landscape professionals. And that's a resource that I could send in a follow-up email as well. Uh, another question from Todd says, do you have plans for collection systems using IBC totes for longer term collection? Yeah, interestingly, you know, we don't, our, our, if you spend some time on Blue Barrel's website, you'll see that we're, you know, we have some pretty intricate mechanisms to help people design a system through our online store and um, kind of end up with a good end product. Um, I, IBC totes, for people who don't know, um, they're those big, they're 275 gallons, they're big and square, they're, they're usually kind of translucent and they often come in like a cage kind of thing. And I think people kind of eye them for rainwater harvesting because they're stackable, they're pretty big. Um, what happens, so first they're not UV resistant um, un unless you paint them, but what happens is the, the corners are a weak point. So after, over time, you know, the, the corners are exposed to the elements and they'll start to crack um, after a while. Um, and then you can't build, you can't mimic the under plumbing. Um, we, I mean, we just have a really specific design to kind of um, meet all the code compliance features that we've done. So we don't, we don't have a way to do that with IBC tanks, but, um, um, you know, I think you can kind of go on YouTube and um, and see who's doing what with those, and then just consider um, if you can find information about how those systems do sort of four or five years after installation, because people are usually pretty excited when they first get something up and running, but um, they're not going to put post a new video when all the corners are cracked and the algae's growing in the tanks. Yeah. Great, thank you. How would you secure these in an earthquake area? Okay, um, so that's a good question. We get the question a lot. You can strap them. Um, so it, in the code, no matter what kind of tank you use, if, if your tank is more than um, two to one ratio of height to width, it has to be strapped. Um, 
the the barrels don't have to be and in fact um was it 20 i'm losing track of time 2014 when we had the big earthquake in american canyon so i was sort of we had we had a very big earthquake nearby um a couple of years after blue barrel launch and i was sort of expecting to get a lot of feedback about systems that cracked or whatnot um we got none um the, the actually the only contact i heard was someone her inlet hose detached and she had to go out there and stick it back in um so it does not mean that the barrel they're, they're heavy they're very stable if there's water in them, it may matter how much water is in them because if there's some water in them they're going to be ballasted down um i'm not going to tell you that they can't be knocked over in an earthquake so you can strap them but we've had very few people actually do it um if you want to strap them i know we have photos of this um on our website you use a like a nylon ratchet strap you can get them at automotive stores um when i go on google i see a lot of people who have used like that metal plumber's tape don't use that that i mean that that will eat away, especially if there's seismic activity in your area metal on plastic is not good and that's gonna eat into the barrels over time um it's also not terribly strong and a massive jolt so um you can find your building studs and strap four barrels together or more um over an eight foot span um, using a nylon ratchet strap, incredibly strong and you know you can ratchet it tight. Um, so, so that's how I would approach that if you, if you want to strap your barrels. Thank you, we have a specific question from Carol who is a renter and has metal downspouts and is not sure if the owner is gonna let her cut them. Do you have any suggestions for other ways to collect rain? Yeah, so first of all, um, I was a renter for many, many years and I installed systems on all my rentals. Um, I, not all, all but one. And I always ask my landlord. Um, I don't recommend doing it without permission, but a few things to understand. Um, first of all, many landlords, many may be supportive of the idea. Um, the first rental we lived in, when we left, they bought them from us. I was planning to take them with us, but they bought them, um, which is great, much more convenient. Um, you don't actually have to cut the downspout. The diverter we use, um, and I'll show it to you later, but you just drill a hole in the downspout. And then what a lot of people don't realize is downspouts are really cosmetic. You're not actually doing anything to the um, major infrastructure of the house. So if the landlord doesn't wanna keep it, when it's empty, you can take the whole thing apart and take it with you. So um, all you'd have to do is replace the downspout. Downspouts are very inexpensive. I wanna say, well, depending on the material, but it's you know, between 12 and $20 for a segment of downspout. and whether you do it yourself or hire a handy person to slap a downspout on it's it's not major work so um so think of i mean i don't consider being a renter to be um insurmountable if your landlord pays your water bill they they should be on board with it um but um yeah i think you just don't want to approach them sort of understanding that it's not major work on a house to replace a downspout Great, we have four more questions that I think we can get through pretty quickly. Somebody is asking for resources on how to purify rainwater for drinking. Yeah, you know, I don't specialize in that only because, you know, I'm, I'm not a um, potable water expert. It's just, I don't want to get into liabilities where I don't belong, but um, you can, you can test, it, it's just water. It's like if, you know, if you go camping and you're drinking water out of a stream, you're using some sort of purification pump or water bottle or the little UV light any of those things will work on rainwater. So I can't tell you conclusively, you know, if you want to be certain you're going to want to test it after and drink it and you can buy home kits. Um, I, I'm not going to um, speak at the expert level on that, but we do have a blog that'll give you some starting points and ideas on that. Is BPA a concern with the plastic barrels? No, the barrels are HDPE, they're not BPA. So, um, and they're food grade drums. So, you know, I also am not a fan of plastic, but the reason this whole thing comes together is because plastic exists and we're finding a way to recycle it and upcycle it, right, into something more useful. So, um, what I tell people who are concerned about the barrels is that the plastic is food grade. Um, and it is what food, if you've ever eaten in a restaurant or eaten any kind of plastic food, this is what the food industry ships our edibles in. So, you know, tomato sauce, oils, flavorings, everything, you name it. So you're already eating it, right? Whatever's in it, it's HDPE and it's considered safe. Um, but the, the, you know, the, that's just sort of what's, what's done as standard. Awesome. Do you have any suggestions for catching on slope? Um, I, I might need a clarification. Oh, like if the ground is sloped? It's catching on a slope method. So perhaps maybe if the ground is sloped or maybe if you're on a hill? 
Yeah, so, you know, as far as gravity fed irrigation, if you have slope working in your favor, that's excellent. So any opportunity, you know, say you have this perfect condition where you have a house on a hill and a garden downhill and you can catch at the top and irrigate at the bottom, that's your best idea. Um, in general, um, the, you want the ground itself where your tank is to be perfectly level. You're not going to want to step tanks down the side. I mean, the key is that the tops of the tanks all have to align. So I suppose you could create some really creative setup where you have a short tank and a taller tank and a taller tank so that the tops are all aligned. I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question, but um, those are some of the principles. Thanks. Um, Thank and I don't know, I, I also um, want to let people know that we do have a video on gravity fed drip and then I have some show and tell of parts too. Um, so if anyone's sort of waiting for, for more, we can take more questions at the end. Um, what do we think on that? Yeah, we have one last question about local rules and laws in regards to catching rain on your land. Um, and in areas where restrictions may be in place, is there a reason that this method is more acceptable and not considered an illegal catch? Okay, no, I'm actually glad that came up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I can hardly post anything on Facebook without a million comments. Hey, not where I live, that's illegal. Huh? You know, um, the truth is um, rainwater harvesting is legal almost everywhere if it's done right. Um, there are massive myths out there about being illegal. And my theory about why is because it's just way too, I mean, I'm picturing like Tim the Toolman Taylor and that Mr. Wilson guy over the fence going like, hey, did you hear rainwater harvesting is illegal? Like if your neighbor tells you that, like that rumor is just going to spread, right? Um, what I ask people who say that to, to me is I say, well, can you cite the code? Um, I've never had anybody cite code for me. So there are a few exceptions. Um, Colorado until 2016 was the only state in the nation that had a, or, uh, maybe Nevada too. So in 2016, Colorado eased their restrictions. In 2017, Nevada lifted their restrictions. At this point, I'm not aware of any state level bans on rainwater harvesting. In fact, cities, lots of cities have programs for water conservation and they recognize the environmental benefit and they incentivize it. So before, you know, as you're looking for local laws and regulations, you might actually want to attack the angle of, can I get a rebate for this? Um, and we have, we do have a, a page on our website with lots of local rebates. So here where I live in Santa Rosa, I can get 25 cents per gallon back from the city. Our city has a rebate program. Um, so in Colorado, Colorado residents are limited to two barrels per household. It has to do with a really antiquated set of rules of the Colorado River, um, you know, delivers water to 18 states and parts of Mexico. And by law, those states own the water. So if you catch it on your property before it gets to the river, it's called the Prior Appropriations Act. It's not our main topic of the day. But um, I think the reason the 2016 law passed to allow limited harvesting is because it's understood by science that rainwater harvesting actually helps hydrologic health. Because we have you know, all this runoff happening and these environmental benefits we talked to, this water is getting back into the soil and that's what actually maintains the base level um, in the rivers. So the more that hydrologists can influence politicians with science, it's sort of like, the same issues we have the world over of like, how do we get policy to, to reflect science? But so my first thing is if you've heard it's illegal in your area, I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say it's probably not. If you find a law on the book somewhere, send it to me, cause you'll be the first. <laughs> um, and if you live in Colorado, obviously um, you have a limit on your storage capacity. Great, well that wraps it up for the questions. Do you want me to launch the poll or do you want to just decide which we do next uh, between video? And you know content? what? The poll sounds like fun. So let's just, let's people, it. we'll do them both, but we'll say, what do we do first? So here, here's what we have on deck. Um, and and we've done, questions. yeah, we've done some Q and A and we can do more Q and A at the end. So we're really asking you to vote between watching the video, which is a five and a half minute video that shows a gravity fed drip irrigation system. Um, and then show and tell, which is where I'm going to show you some parts like the downspout diverter and the leaf feeder um, and some, some gravity fed drip parts. Um, so, so go ahead, take a poll and we'll, we'll see what you want to do first. <clears throat> All right, entries are looking like they're slowing down. Oh, should we close the poll? We're gonna close the poll in five, 
four, three, two, one. All right, we close the poll. Looks like 73% uh, of folks would like to watch the video first. Great. Can we see the poll? Um, Sharon was yeah, now. Yeah. Can you see him? Yeah. So we, 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 Liz and I spent some time, and Serena, who you haven't gotten to meet, but we was behind the scenes, we spent some time practicing these cool features on Zoom. So, yeah, so we have to put it we're in the show us, is what we're doing. Um, all right, let's watch a video. Um, so bear with me. I'm still sharing my screen, but you know, remind me, do I have to stop screen share to pull up the video? Probably not. No, I don't think so. You just open up uh, your browser, wherever okay. it is. Okay, and I'm going to... Um, Oh, you know what? I think I do stop the screen share because we have to hit that sound setting, right? That's the problem we had earlier. So I'm going to stop. Sorry, guys, we're experimenting. We're learning on you. Um, I'm going to stop my screen share. I'm going to fix a setting. Um, and then you want to share your browser. Right. Okay, so if you haven't had enough of me yet, here's me on video. Yeah, I'm gonna show you our gravity fed drip irrigation system that I just installed yesterday and today actually. Um, but I'm starting here. Um, this one I installed about a year and a half ago. And if you go to our website, which is bluebarrelsystems.com, you'll find a blog all about gravity fed drip. And I have a picture of this when it was just installed. So you can see how much it's grown in the last year and a half. Um, but anyway, this uh, little perimeter garden is full of pollinators and it's irrigated solely with the water that we catch in these seven barrels. This is a classic blue barrel rainwater catchment system. Um, I have drip irrigation coming off of this far end um, and it feeds um, this garden and actually this will irrigate this garden. Um, we live in California, which has a long, dry, hot summer. Um, and those seven barrels will actually irrigate this um, for most of the summer, um, depending exactly when it starts raining again, but it's lasted all summer before. Um, so anyway, I haven't touched that in about a year and a half. The irrigation lines are still there. Um, it's on a little gravity fed irrigation timer. Um, and I'm going to show you some of these parts more close up um, over on the other system that I just installed today. So let's head over um, to the other side of the yard. So this was my weekend project today. Uh, first, I'll show you, and you may have seen a video of me describing this before. We tucked four more barrels behind this shed. Um, this is not a roof tide system. We have no gutters here, but what we do, you know, we have so much water available to us from our the roof of our little bungalow that when those seven barrels fill and you have another three in front, um, we just pump the water into these four. Um, and it's still set up just like a blue barrel system, all under plumbed. Um, but that allows us to keep catching water from our roof tide systems and we have even more water here. Um, so I set this up originally so that we could do gravity fed drip. Um, I'll just go over these parts with you. Um, so every blue barrel system comes with a drain valve that's ready to connect a drip irrigation system to. Um, I'll do a little weeding while we're at it. Um, this is our streamlined drip irrigation filter. Um, a fine mesh filter is really, really important for drip irrigation. You don't want to clog your emitters. Um, and then that feeds into our solar. You, know, you can actually see on this side, if you bring the camera around, there's a solar panel there. So this operates on solar recharge batteries. Um, we sell all these parts and batteries in our online store at bluebarrelsystems.com. Um, but you know, a lot of people are worried they don't have good solar access. This will operate with regular AA batteries if you're worried about um, solar access. But anyway, um, we have a dial here. You can set the frequency and duration. Right now I have it set to do um, 30 minutes every 24 hours um, and that should be enough for now but it's more of an art than a science so I'll just see how my garden does. Um, I have my drip line coming over here and the kit I used was our drip irrigation kit with inline emitters. We have another version that's bubbler emitters but all of this drip equipment is um, designed specifically to work with without pressure. Um, this is a non-pressurized system. So um, that's the key. When you store water in rain barrels, you have to figure out how to distribute it. So um, take a look. I'm actually going to turn the water on. Keep in mind, there's no pressure here. But if you listen, you'll hear it start up. And check out. Check out. 
just how well that water comes out. Now, again, there's no pressure. This water is coming from those rain barrels. So we're using a timer that's specifically meant for non-pressurized uses. We're using a filter and a whole drip irrigation kit that is meant for non-pressurized systems. So again, you don't want to use regular drip equipment or compensating line. Um, you won't get good output. Now what's going to happen as the summer goes on, it's going to get hotter, right? And also the water in my in my tanks is going to get lower and lower. So as, as the water draws down, I'm actually going to lose pressure. I have probably about one and a half pounds of pressure being generated from um, the three foot elevation on those barrels. That's going to get even less and less. So as time goes on, you know, after a month or so, what I might do is um, increase the duration from 30 minutes to maybe 45, and then by the time I'm really low at the end of the summer, um, to, to 60 minutes. Um, but I just kind of play it by ear. I see how wet my soil is. I see how well my plants are doing. I see what the weather's like, and I adjust accordingly. Um, these timers do have a sensor on them, so if it happens to rain, the timer will automatically not turn on, um, so we don't waste this precious water that we've stored. And actually, I just threw a tank gauge you want to know how full your barrels are, um, I'm just going to read this little tank gauge and I can see the water level. So right now I'm almost full, but as the summer goes on, I'm going to um, watch that gauge move. So anyway, I hope this was instructive. Do check out our website, bluebarrelsystems.com. We again have a blog, if you browse our blogs, that highlights um, a lot of different aspects of what you need to think about when you do drip irrigation by gravity feed. And if you head into our online store, you'll see we have all the equipment to build a blue barrel system with uh, recycled barrels that we source locally to every customer actually and then we sell all the drip irrigation equipment too that's specially curated to work with non-pressurized rain barrels. All right let's get out in the garden. Okay uh-oh YouTube has taken over just a second. Okay, we're back. So were folks able to hear that video okay? And did that kind of make sense on the gravity fed drip? Okay. Yes. Good. Um, and do we have some more questions? And again, I see a lot of chats. Um, I know I'm not able to um, kind of go in and manage chats right now, but we are asking if you have a question to put it under Q&A. That's separate from chat. Okay, um, so there we go. All right, so if um, we may, we can go ahead and do, um, I'll do a little show and tell of some parts for those who are still with us. Um, a lot of people are curious about a downspout diverter and how, so um, how you actually get the water into barrels. And you know, there's different ways. If you're doing a large tank, you might actually kind of remove a downspout and put use PVC pipe to route the water all the way. And you might have a full three or four inch inlet on your tank if you're doing something very large. If you're doing a rain barrel, usually you're not going to want to use a massive pipe like that. Um, and you're going to have to consider overflow at the same time. So the reason I like um, the downspout diverter I'm about to show you is because it does handle overflow automatically. So um, I hope you recognize this. It's a piece of downspout. Um, and this is the diverter we use. And I'll take it out to show it to you. This is called a FlexiFit diverter. Um, and it's a really neat piece. I'm actually gonna take the hose off too. Okay, so let's see how well you can see that. Um, this seals inside of a two by three inch downspout. It will also, you know, two by three is standard household size. It will also work on a three by four inch. You put it in the three inch side size. That's a more industrial size downspout, but um, it will seal around half of the downspout. And it, you know, when you do the math, if you're using one of these diverters, you probably don't need more water than that. But um, one thing you can do, this came up recently with a customer, if you do have a three by four inch industrial size downspout, you can go in from both sides and have two of these butt up together inside the downspout. So the dimensions work out for that. We do have a version of this for round downspouts as well, um, but this is the most typical. So um, as you can see, it's, it's kind of a rubberized head here. I'm squishing it. Um, and then it has a reservoir here 
part around around the end. So um, I will stick it back in the downspout. To install it, you just drill a hole in the downspout with a hole saw. You insert the rubberized head, and then that's what it looks like on the inside. So again, this is where I like to have fun with the audience and say, well, what do you notice? Like, what's the deal with that big hole in the middle, right? Um, so here's a cool thing about water in a downspout. Water does not free fall in a downspout. It hugs the edges, okay? So if you think about, if you've ever tried to pour water from one cup into another and you've had that thing where the water just dribbles back down the side of the cup and down your arm, it's, that's what water does naturally. It's a surface tension. So, um, so the water is going to kind of trickle down the side of the downspout um, and most of it really is going to end up in that reservoir and it's going to shoot out this way and this is where you have your inlet hose and then um, this thing is adjustable up to two and a half feet and you know we do have longer ones for those who need more um, and this inserts into the barrel. Now you install this so that the hose is level. Um, and then this, here's why there's a big hole in the middle of the diverter. So when your barrels are full, the water's gonna back up in the hose again. And it's gonna start rising in this column and it's gonna spill over the middle and go down your downspout as though the barrels weren't there. So that's a really beautiful solution. I love this piece, it's brilliant. It's just the shape of it. There's no on and off switch. Um, so whenever you have capacity in your barrels, the water will go in. And when you have no capacity in your barrels the water will go down which means you will not have a mess or an overflow issue to manage now of course when you have time for another project we always recommend disconnecting the bottom of your downspout and creating a passive infiltration situation but you know you, you're not gonna have to deal with that immediately the overflow is um, handled so this is cool I like to pass this around the room but you'll just have to take my word for it this time um, this piece is optional, but I highly recommend it. This is a leaf eater. Um, and you saw these in some of the pictures that I showed. And um, you can find lots more pictures on the website. Um, but this piece um, will keep debris out in a, you know, we, we do use a little sheet of mesh in, in that inlet, but if you have any kind of leaves overhanging your, your gutter system at all, I highly recommend this piece. So for, to install this, you do cut the downspout. Um, and then, but you don't have to cut it exactly or anything like that. The water's just going to free flow onto this um, sheet. And if I can get it close enough, maybe you can see that that's a 16th inch, inch steel mesh, stainless steel. Um, and then it's literally, you know, a lot of people kind of intuitively put these up really high, like up at the downspout drop. I recommend installing them right at eye level because you walk up to it, the only maintenance your whole system is ever going to need is this you pop this off you tap it off you tap off the leaves and you pop it back on and it has a really cool adapter on it so if you have round downspouts or if you are doing a big tank with pvc um, this fits four inch pvc around the outside or three inch pvc around the inside and then if you have um, rectangular downspouts this sinks inside that industrial three by four and this lip in here takes the household size two by three. So that's, um, actually I'll show you exactly what we would do with this. It's gonna fight with me because I'm on camera, but I'll get it, there we go. Okay, so that goes on like that. And actually, I mean, I would actually install this down a little lower, it's just, I'm using a sample here that's not measured quite right. But it's just a really neat fitting, easy to install piece. And I'll tell you, I just, you know, we just moved to a new house and it's stucco. And I, you know, I am not like a, I don't consider myself a good builder. And I say that to encourage you. If you think, how am I ever gonna do this? It's not that hard. Hardest thing I've ever done was how do you screw into stucco? It was, I watched a lot of YouTube videos and I finally got it, but it took me more practice than I like to admit. So that was the hardest part of my install was getting the screws into the stucco on the side of my house. I'm sure some of you are laughing at me. That's my intent, <laughs> okay? Um, and then the last thing I'll show you, this beautiful little piece is a, um, a drip irrigation filter. Um, I know a lot of you probably have drip systems or at least have seen them on regular municipal pressurized water and you've seen the manifold and you've seen the big like 
kind of cartridge filter thing. Um, I don't recommend those for gravity feed because the water has to go in and back out of the filter and you really want to keep the water flowing straight as much as possible. Um, when you're on a flat site, you can get about 20 feet of distribution. Um, that video I showed, I think those garden beds, the, the closer one was maybe eight feet from the barrels and the farther one was closer to 16 feet away. Um, so you can get the water to distribute that far if you don't impede the flow. Um, so, so this is a streamlined filter. Um, this just screws on to any garden fitting. Um, and then the filter itself looks like this. And, and so this is a 100 mesh filter and you do need a, a fine filter when you're doing drip irrigation. And that's any, even if pressurized, uh, you always need a filter because any particulates in the water are gonna clog um, drip emitters. So this is a really key piece. And then that timer I showed, we actually carry a different version of it now. Um, the solar timers turned out, um, there, there were some issues with the supply chain on those and they turned out not to work as well as a different version. It's still, it's very similar to the one I showed, um, but it's less expensive and more reliable. And the timers are really cool. The one caution I have on timers is um, make sure you get a timer that's specifically for zero pressure applications. If you go to a hardware store and buy one of those little green egg shaped ones, um, and I've seen people do this, you'll, you'll you'll put it on and it'll look like it's working. You'll be really excited. And then you'll go inside and you'll come out the next day and your barrels will be drained. And the reason is um, they require pressure to stay closed. So you'll be able to turn it on. It'll look like it's working, but it's not gonna close all the way. Um, so the battery operated, you know, these, these timers have like a, a battery operated turn mechanism, a ball valve inside that fully closes mechanically. Um, and that's what you need for gravity feed. So that I think, that kind of does it for my show and tell. Um, we may have another question or two by now. Yeah, we have one last question. I do also want to mention that I did type in some answers that I had answers to. So if folks uh, asked a question but didn't hear it being answered live, if you go ahead and click on the Q&A and click the answered section and scroll down to your question, uh, you'll see show all and there you'll see some of those answers. Um, but we have one last question. Dale asks, is there a parts list on the drip irrigation? Yeah, so um, we, um, is there a parts list on the drip, drip irrigation? Yeah, so in, in, it depends, um, you know, who you're buying from. We do have, we sell them on our website and we do, um, our parts detail shows a parts list. And then if you need extra parts, we can, um, we have a printed parts list that we can sort of use like a menu. Um, if you're kind of shopping around for this stuff, um, I don't know what others offer, but you, there's just things you need to consider. You have to use non-compensating line um, and you wanna be using filters um, and timers that are specifically meant for, for gravity feed. Um, and then you, um, oh, I lost my train of thought, of course. Um, but yes, parts lists are available. Great. Looks like we have one more question from Kay. They ask, what's the best way to winterize the system? Okay, um, so that is gonna depend on your climate zone. We have a blog about that too. Um, Many climate zones don't require much at all. So here in California, you know, we get light intermittent freezes and that's not enough to really require anything. So the standard guidance is you want to follow standard plumbing protocols for your region. So um, there's sort of three categories, lots of places. Um, you, you know, we don't really need to do anything here in California. Um, if if, if the, the next level would be, you can insulate the pipes. Um, if you think they need that, it has to get real cold before barrels actually start, you know, barrels themselves start freezing. So if you're in a really cold climate, like a, you know, Minnesota or somewhere where you're ice skating on the lake, um, most people will drain and detach a rainwater catchment system in the winter, and then you just hook it up again um, when, when, the, when the snow melt, you know, starts coming down your downspout. So, um, so, and to do that, you know, th there's different, I mean, dis it just depends on how you've built your system, but if you're using a diverter like the one I showed, there is a little winter cover piece that'll restore the hole in the downspout during the winter while you're disconnected. Um, there's also a cool trick that I'll share, um, you know, so I say we don't protect our pipes here in California, but there have been times where it gets a little too cold for a little too long, and if you, if your pipes are not insulated, what you can do is go put a slow drip in the 
in the tap because moving water does freezes at a much lower temperature than okay so if you're worried if your pipe pipes aren't protected and you're worried they're gonna break just go put a drip on the tap and then remember to shut it off again in the morning um and you know presumably at that time of year you're still getting more rain so you don't have to worry about flooding off your water but um that's what you could do if you find yourself unprepared nice that was a great suggestion it looks like at this point there are no more questions but what i would like to say is if anything comes up for folks after the fact reach out we're always here as a resource as daily acts blue barrel has a fantastic uh, customer resource page and jesse has already mentioned a number of different resources that blue barrel has to share um, so i took over the screen here jesse but is there anything else you would like to say in conclusion I don't think so. I want to, I mean, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, you know, if you have blue barrel specific questions, we do have customer service. I would, you know, my intention today was to give you more of a broader overview. Um, and, and, you know, in keeping with Earth Day, the environmental benefits and lots of different approaches you might be able to take. So my hope is that you've left with some new knowledge, something you can share at that next cocktail party you go to, um, and that maybe you're inspired to get a shovel out or do a little something on your property to help um, become yeah, help that hydrologic cycle get back to where it needs to be. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. And then for those of you who are still with us, I do wanna mention that Daily X has an upcoming webinar also related to water conservation and reuse. It's going to be Gray Water Concepts and Considerations with Laura Allen, who is the co-founder of Gray Water Action. So this is just gonna be another amazing opportunity to learn about water that you're already paying for and how you can use it twice, pay for it once. That's gonna be a fun one on May 14th. You can get more information on this at the Daily Acts website. And again, I will be following up in an email by the end of the week with some of these resources. Um, and lastly, I do again, wanna thank you all for being here, of course, and make mention that during this time, as you can imagine, small nonprofits and businesses are especially impact by the coronavirus. And if you are able, we do ask that you can make a donation to Daily X. That way we can bring more of these presentations to you and ideally continue to reach this wider audience. Um, but again, thank you just so much for being here tonight. And echoing Jesse, I hope that you take your newfound knowledge and share it back with your community members. And uh, I'll continue to say, if you have any questions, reach out. We really appreciate you all being here tonight. Thank you very much. Getting a lot of chats for thank yous. We appreciate all of you. Good. Will we be able to review questions after we end the webinar, Liz? Or do we yeah. lose all those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You and I can certainly, uh, do you mean live, in live time with folks? No, but I mean, if, if we needed to follow up or- Certainly. Or see yeah. what we missed, yeah. Okay, and, and I'll say, it's possible we missed your question. So you <laughs> reach out to us, you know, if, if, you, if you needed to continue a conversation. Absolutely. And uh, just to reiterate, we will certainly be sending out uh, an email in follow up with additional resources and to echo the resources that Jesse shared. We'll share a copy of this presentation. We'll link you to some upcoming events and uh, that way you'll have our contact information. So you absolutely can reach out at that point. Great. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. I think at this point we are going to sign off and end this meeting. Jesse will be in Thanks. touch. Great. We'll see you Thank later. Thank you all so much. Take care and have a good <laughs> evening. <laughs>